All right, I'd like to welcome everybody here for the 91st series of what Woo! businesses do. Yes, I think that's, that's um, worthy of a woohoo. I appreciate that. <laughs> Joe appreciates that, I'm sure. And all of our former hosts of the series. Um, so I wanted to mention then for students who are enrolled in the class for credit, those are physics 494 students. So if you are in an astronomy 100 type class, you are not um, listening to the first part, which is the top part is for students enrolled in the class for credit should sign in at every period. Um, and they, they've been told this and they're doing it diligently because it's there. Um, down below, if you're in an Astronomy 100 or an Intro Physics class where your instructor is saying this is a great series, we want you to come to it and we want to see that you, you come to it, go ahead and, and sign in. That's down at the bottom. Um, we'll wait till now because we have the speaker. We'll do this um, afterwards and maybe the, it'll go, um, go outside of class so if we continue to have a discussion it's not a disruption to the rest of us. Um, once again, as a reminder, these go to 5.15, uh, we have the room, we usually have our talks last about an hour with a few questions, and then the rest of us might stay till 5.15 with more questions. But if possible, um, there'll be a time for you to leave at, at 5 o'clock. Um, that's it in general about how it fits in academically. I'd like to mention that the series would not be possible without um, our donors and without um, funds that we've uh, acquired from the instructionally related activities <coughs> funding. So things to help the, the student environment here and to give you a broader sense of experiences. So we use a combination of that and um, donations from viewers like you. Um, that is uh, most appreciated. So uh, I'd like to start off the semester letting everyone know that that, that is appreciated and is vital to our series. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Target here was assisting me, um, and we'll get this a little smoother for the, the future talks this semester, but we had a little hiccup on the, on the food front. So our speaker today is, is Dan McKinsey, who um, joined U, UC Berkeley in 2015, um, and as is my want and uh, with uh, secret helpers that, that, that send me um, send me updates of what's happening in, in science in the Bay Area, I'm talking about Joe Ten still says, these are interesting things. Um, but a combination, in this case, it was either me just sort of knowing, oh, a new hire, let's look at what he does. And um, it's related to dark matter direct detection. So we know in this series, we often have talks in astronomy that touch on this mysterious part of the universe. Um, in today's lecture, we're going to hear about how we're actually trying to identify this particle with a direct detection. We see evidence of it in the largest structures in the universe. Um, Dan, uh, uh, Dr. Dan McKinsey got his Bachelor of Science at University of Michigan. He went um, on to get a PhD at Harvard, uh, where he was working in the trapping and storage of ultra-cold uh, neutrons. He was working in the, these areas of, of particle physics. but but uh, went in to try to find other particles than, than just neutrons. Um, his postdoc was at Princeton, and then he went to uh, Yale um, first uh, uh, on the tenure track, but he became a full professor at Yale, um, but he got lured by the West Coast, as most of us, probably all of us in this room have, and so he's now at UC Berkeley. As I said, he works on this ability um, to measure or to look to see if we can see direct interactions between a, a, the, the posited dark matter particles, which really a zoo of things that might be the dark matter, and, and his in particular is to look at something called a WIMP, a weakly interacting massive particle, um, with the Lux ex experiment. Uh, so he's going to describe that, that very interesting experiment here today. Um, uh, we are just thrilled to have uh, Dr. McKinsey. He's been awarded the Packard Fellowship and the Sloan Fellowship. Uh, he's just a, a, a rising star in physics, and this is a great topic, and let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. So today I'll be talking about um, some experiments that uh, we built and one that we're building. Uh, to try to d directly detect dark matter particles. And I thought I'd start with uh, a poem that I think is, uh, you'll see the connection later, but it says, Who has seen the wind, neither I nor you? But when the leaves hang trembling, the wind is passing through. So this is like dark matter. There's this dark matter wind all around us, 
and we're looking for uh, its interaction with ordinary matter. That might be like its inter the wind's interaction with the leaves. Who has seen the wind? Neither you nor I. But when the trees bow down their heads, the wind is passing by. So this was in a book of children's poems. I read to my children. So anyway, I thought this was appropriate. And uh, I'll be talking about dark matter. So a bit of introduction about what is dark matter? Why do we believe in dark matter? Um, turns out that most of the universe, about uh, three quarters of the universe is something called dark energy, and about one quarter is something called dark matter. And by dark here, we basically mean invisible. Early on when the terms were coined, it was something you couldn't see, so called dark, but really dark matter is light doesn't, it doesn't absorb light, it doesn't emit light, it's basically invisible matter is a more appropriate term. Um, in fact, we know that there are particles like that already. Things like, well, neutrinos. There's a particle called the neutrino. They're emitted by the sun in enormous quantities. If you hold up your thumb and point it towards the sun, you get about 60 billion neutrinos through your thumbnail every second. Uh, if you're near a nuclear reactor, you're getting an even higher flux of neutrinos, but they hardly interact with you. They go right through you. You're hardly there. Very, 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 very occasionally they will interact. Okay. So the idea is that could dark matter be something like a neutrino that hardly interacts at all, doesn't interact with light. Uh, and also dark matter, the existence of dark matter, is some of the best evidence we have for new particle physics, physics beyond the so-called standard model of particle physics. The Higgs particle, which you've heard about recently, discovered is like the last puzzle piece. It's the last <coughs> piece of the standard model. It's a piece we knew we had to, had to be there or something like it. And it, so it just fit right in the box, right, right where the puzzle piece was supposed to go. Okay, But we're still left with some basic mysteries. We know there's more particle physics. Like, what is the dark matter? Another example is what causes the mass, the matter, antimatter asymmetry in the universe? There are only a few clear questions that we, that we know the answers have to invoke new particle physics. And the nature of dark matter is one of them. So the evidence for dark matter um, historically has come uh, through looking at galaxies, rotational curves, and looking at galaxy clusters. If you look at, uh, take a galaxy, you look at the stars going around the galaxy, they're whizzing around the galaxy at some velocity. Okay? And from Kepler's law, you expect um, for a centralized mass, for the, part, for the uh, part planets to be dropping off in velocity, like one over the square root of velocity. And if you look, if you look at the, the planets in our solar system, they're dropping off just right, just as this one over the square root of um, distance. But if you look at galaxies, those velocities are shooting out and staying fairly constant to very, very large radii, which basically means that there's a lot more matter in there that's allowing this to be glued together, to be held together despite the great velocities in which these stars are whips, whipping around the galaxy. Similarly, if you look at galaxies and galaxy clusters and the velocities of those galaxies around the center of mass, they're going much faster than you would get if you just counted up all the things that you could see with telescopes. Okay, they're moving around much faster. Also, if you uh, image some object in the background behind a, a galaxy cluster, you can actually get light that's bent around the cluster. And here's some examples of these little rings here. These are basically the same object, but in the background, lens with a light lens around the galaxy cluster. You can actually do the inverse problem. Say, what's the pattern of lensing to figure out what's the matter in between? And if you do that inverse problem, you find that there's all this gravitational stuff going out to much larger radii, much more diffuse than the stuff that you can see in uh, X-rays or visible light or any other wavelength. Also, if you look at the cosmic microwave background, uh, light from the time when hydrogen began recombining, the turn was no longer a plasma, the electrons started recombining with ions, and the light escapes. This gives us a sort of a fingerprint of the universe at that time. And if you look at the correlations between different points on the sky, those correlations are fit with a model that gives you a uh, so-called power spectrum, and the ratio of the peaks in that power spectrum gives you the ratio of total matter to ordinary matter. 
and that backs up the same large fraction of dark matter in the universe. And there are other pieces of evidence as well, and they're all consistent with dark matter being a quarter of the universe. Okay? But we don't know what it is. We know that it's uh, stable. It has to be stable on the lifetime of the universe time scale, 14 billion years. It's electrically neutral or close to neutral. Maybe a, a micro uh, uh, electron charge might be allowed, but pretty small is what's possible. Non-baryonic, meaning it's not made of neutrons and protons. It's non-relativistic, it can't be going too fast, otherwise it would wash out a lot of the structure we'd see in the universe. So it has to be relatively slow. And if you take figure out what the density is right here, it's 0.3 uh, GeV per cubic centimeter, particle physics units, or about a third of a proton per cubic centimeter. Okay, and that's here, it's in the sun, it's in Mars, it's 200 miles underground, doesn't matter. Same density of this dark matter, okay, if it's not interacting with this, like a neutrino. So some of the candidates, one's called the WIMP, which I'll tell you about. Now this axion, dark photons, there are a number of ideas for what the dark matter could be, and I'll be focusing on this one called the big. Okay. Uh, this is just more, yet more evidence for dark matter. So WIMP, weakly interacting massive particle. Now physicists like to take ordinary words and give them specific meanings. And in this case, weakly is a technical term, which means interacting by exchange of W and Z and Higgs bosons. Okay. It's a, these are heavy particles, and two particles need to get extremely close to each other to interact if they're exchanging a heavy particle. Neutrinos are like this. Neutrinos are weakly interacting particles. Uh, but if you had a new particle weakly interacting and interacting with ordinary matter, Turns out it could form dark matter. It would be produced in enormous amounts in the Big Bang, and then there would this, be this freeze-out process. And the density of the dark matter goes down, it stops interacting with itself, and it freezes out at a certain value. Okay. And this is this kind of physics is very common. It's actually used to understand the production of, of light elements at the early universe. A lot of the same uh, techniques apply and are very successful. And so we're pretty confident about that kind of prediction. You have a particle that interacts with a weak interaction. It should decouple from ordinary matter, and the amount of dark matter actually looks to be about right under that scenario, which is pretty amazing. It's called the WIMP miracle. And the neat thing is that a lot of physics, particle physics models, beyond the standard models, things like supersymmetry or extra dimensions, predict stable particles that could be the dark matter. Okay. These particles, these these. Theories are not proven, there's no evidence for them, experimental evidence. But if they're true, they can easily give you a stable particle that's the dark matter. So this field is sort of taking stuff from astrophysics and particle physics and combining them in a fascinating way. But there are many, many more theories. Okay. Uh, theorists in my field, Tim Tate, made, made this uh, plot all these different possible kinds of theories, and pretty much all of them give you, can give you some kind of dark matter particle that's stable and long enough. Yeah. Stable and... Dr. McKenzie, is this, is this standard? Because I was laughing because I recognized this from, like, I'm not reading the literature in this field, but mm -hmm. I was reading an article saying, you know, some of these particle, you know, uh, this intersection between cosmology and particle physics, and I had a figure that was very similar to this. It was, it was a web app and I was mm -hmm. I was finding details about each one of these topics. Cool. Yeah. Um, so this is this is the, the figure in, in well the this field is or... a figure that there was this process called snow mass that Heinrich physics went through a couple of years ago where we generated a whole bunch of documents talking about what was interesting in particle physics. And the part about that about dark matter, we decided that having some kind of two dimensional depiction of the theory space would be handy. Yeah. And so I said, Tim, can you get this on the two-dimension? He said, well, I'll try. And this is what he did. So, I don't know if it's the original version, but it's what we came up with. OK, so we know there's dark matter. Uh, and so there are many different experiments you can do to try to figure out what the dark matter is. And it's a bit of a fishing expedition. I would argue that most of particle physics right now is a fishing expedition. We know that there's probably new physics, but we don't know how it will manifest itself. 
Uh, and so an, a fishing expedition helps to have a really big net, okay, and it helps to be fishing in promising waters. In this case, we know there is fish. There's a dark matter particle. We just don't know exactly how to catch it. Okay, but a discovery could come at any time. A lot of these uh, approaches to looking for dark matter are going forward very quickly, uh, pro probing new parameter space, probing kinds of interactions that haven't been probed before. And so uh, discovery could, could come at any time. So it's pretty exciting. Okay, so a little bit of the numbers. So if the dark matter particle is about 100 times the mass of a proton, then you get about three wimps per liter, okay, given this density of 0.3 um, GeV per cubic centimeter. And the typical velocities are around 200 kilometers per second. That's the typical velocity for things that are captured in the Milky Way galaxy. Yes? Is it likely that dark matter is consistent? consists of a great zoo of particle types. Of it could well be. I don't know how likely that is. It's a matter of um, pace. Um, you know, ordinary matter, there's all different kinds of particles. And so you might think, well, maybe there's lots of kinds of dark matter particles. And that's entirely possible. On the other hand, if your taste is to keep things simple, if the simplest explanation is more likely to be correct, then you think there's only one kind of dark matter. In a way, neutrinos are dark matter. They're not, it's not enough mass, but we know neutrinos exist. So we already know about one kind of dark matter. They were able to figure out based on theorizing in the 30s and experiments in the 50s until recently. That's a new kind of dark matter that we know exists. So, but that's not enough. We know there's at least one more kind. Most people call neutrinos have dark matter. What's that? Most people call neutrinos have dark matter. Well, I didn't say it, Cole. I, said, I, know, I know you didn't say that. But they are dark matter, but they're hot dark matter. They're, they're relativistic, so they're moving too fast, they smear out the structure. So and one thing is that the cross-section uh, for dark matter on ordinary matter, if the wavelength is large enough, as we think it is, will interact with all of the nucleons in an atom coherently. And in quantum mechanics, you add the amplitudes of interaction and you square it. In this case, that gives you a cross-section that goes as the number of nucleons squared uh, the total cross-section. Okay, and the rates are really small. Okay, if I take a part of that detector, a gamma ray detector, and I plug it in here and turn on, put on the bench, and I turn it on, I'm going to get sort of a thousand events per second per kilogram of material, just for natural radioactivity around us. Okay. You're all radioactive. I'm radioactive. Everything in this room is radioactive at a small level because uranium and thorium are these materials that typically parts per million and potassium also, which has potassium-40. So getting down to extremely low rates is a challenge. It's a, it's a frontier of itself in, in particle physics. In this case, we're looking for like events per year or events per few months. OK, so wind direct detection, OK? Our experiments that I'll be talking about, we're looking for anomalous nuclear recoils in a low background detector, something whacking into a nucleus, making it go bang, like an invisible cue ball hitting some particle. And the rate of, is of order of the number of particles in your detector times the density of the dark matter times some typical cross-section, probability of interacting, times some typical velocity. And so velocities of us and the particles stuck in the, in the Milky Way are around 200 kilometers a second. And if you work out the math, that gives you sort of 10 keV of energy deposition, which is like a hard X-ray, X-ray uh, energy deposition. And if you combine all the different velocities of the dark matter and all the angles it might scatter with ordinary atoms, you end up with kind of a smear of energy deposition, sort of like this exponential here. Okay, and here's some projected predicted exponential shapes of center of in, in recoil energy for different targets like xenon, germanium, argon, and neon. So what we need is a low background experiment, really low background rates in uranium and thorium and potassium and such. We need a pretty low energy threshold in the order of KEVs, tens of KEV. We'd like to be able to reject gamma rays because our signal is a nuclear recoil. Lots of gamma rays flying around, and if you can reject those gamma rays in some way, that, then you're ahead of the game. 
And then if all, you have all those things figured out, then if you can make a bigger detector to get more in here, then you can be sensitive to smaller signals, smaller cross section. And in practice, to reach really low background, you have to do your experiment deep underground. Uh, and that's to get away from cosmic, cosmic ray induced background. The cosmic ray is smashing into the top of the atmosphere all the time, making showers of particles that come through you and go deep into the earth, but are gradually shielded by the rock. And in practice, to get very low backgrounds, you need to be deep underground. Okay, so in my research, we focus a lot on uh, liquefied noble gases or noble liquids. So things are like liquid xenon, argon, krypton, liquid neon, liquid helium. And so my research is basically about detectors using these materials. And so noble gases are very easily purified because they're noble gases. They don't want the chemical to react. So if you put them something that causes chemical reactions, then a lot of the junk, all the impurities, get pulled out. Um, in practice, we use something called the getter, a heated zirconium um, foil, basically, that goes by and reacts with anything that's not a noble gas. Uh, and that's very convenient for getting very low backgrounds and for being able to extract very small signals out of a big detector. We got a lot of signal from ionization. So the electrons, if they're produced, you can actually drift them through the liquid. You can drift them through the liquid for large distances. They also have high scintillation yields. They make a lot of light for a small energy deposition. Uh, just like you know, a neon light, to make a small discharge and get a lot of light. These uh, noble liquids, if you get a particle that scatters in them, you get a flash of light that's very efficiently produced. And uh, that's true even for the nuclear recoils. It's our signal for the dark matter. And if you want a bigger detector, you basically buy a bigger bucket and you fill it with your noble liquid and you have it all instrumented on the inside in order to be able to see the, these really uh, small flashes of light that would come from dark matter interactions. So here's a few of the noble gases. When they're liquefied, they have densities as high as three grams per cubic centimeter, or three times that of water, the liquid xenon. Uh, boiling point, 165 Kelvin. Electron mobility, okay. Scintillation wavelength, 175 nanometers, that's in the vacuum ultraviolet. About 40,000 photons per MeV which is about four times that of a typical organic scintillator, They're very bright. Uh, Long-lived radioactive isotopes. Some of these are actually quite radioactive. Krypton, Krypton's pretty radioactive. It turns out. If you take a cubic meter of air, there's about one Krypton decay per second. Basically, it used to be a lot less before World War II, but all the nuclear testing has raised the amount of Krypton. Don't worry, it's a small compared to all the other radioactive <laughs> But uh, just remember that you're surrounded by radioactivity all the time. Argon-39 uh, is slightly radioactive, but in this business, even that can be a problem. Xenon is very, very, very slightly radioactive, but it's a so-called double beta decay isotope of xenon-136. It basically, if it decays twice at once, then it can uh, give you a beta decay. But the lifetimes are like 10 to the 21 years. So, um, so in principle, it's radioactive, but in practice, it's not a problem for us. Okay. And the scintillation here comes from the decay of dimers, uh, also basically diatomic molecules that are produced in the radiation track, and then decay to two free atoms and emit light. And so the lifetimes of those molecules is different depending on which noble liquid going from 30 nanoseconds all the way up to you know, 13 seconds in here. So anyway, xenon is a nice fast scintillator. Okay, so here's a deluxe collaboration. There's a photo of us out in South Dakota, which I'll tell you about. Uh, got uh, 17 institutions in the US and the UK and Portugal. And okay, this is the kind of plot where we usually show our results, and it's complex, so I'll walk you through it. So the x-axis here is the WIMP mass, the dark matter particles mass, which we don't know. We don't know the mass. 
to be a wide range of possible mass. And remember, that's about a mass of a proton. Uh, out here is the mass of the Higgs boson. It could be a lot heavier, too. Maybe it goes up to you know, 10,000 times the mass of a proton. It could be even heavier. It could be. And here's cross-section in square centimeters. So the larger the cross-section, the larger the chance the dark matter particle will interact with your ordinary matter. If you do an experiment and you don't see anything, then you exclude cross-sections above a certain value. And that value depends on the mass. So you basically draw out a curve, and above that curve, you exclude the models for dark matter. So in 2013, this is where we were, Xenon 100 set the best limits. At the same time, there were a few experiments that were seeing a few anomalous events. And so there was a lot of excitement. Maybe they saw a few events from dark matter. And they were right near sort of their energy thresholds. Um, it's the energy threshold sensitivity prevents you from pushing further left on this curve. Um, so there are right, very slow energy events. That's where we were. Uh, the dashed lines show you various predictions for new future experiments. This dashed orange line gives you a limit beyond which it will be very difficult to make further progress because we will start being, being limited by neutrinos in the sun and from the atmosphere, at which point these neutrinos will become an inherent background. Uh, and so it will prevent us from tech checking for cross-sections below the orange line. So, as you can see, we're about four orders of magnitude away at this point. Okay, so the technology, I'll say how it works, it's a so-called two-phase xenon detector. Uh, it's basically your bucket of liquid xenon. And we've got a couple of arrays of light detectors. We have 122 very sensitive light detectors called photomultiplier tubes. We apply an electric field to the liquid xenon. And so electrons that are liberated from a scattering event move upwards through the liquid xenon and are extracted into gaseous xenon. And in the gaseous xenon, those electrons bang into xenon atoms and make the xenon atoms fluoresce. So for every electron, we can get hundreds of photons produced. This is a way of amplifying very small charge signals. In addition, we have this initial flash of light so the time between those flashes of light gives us the depth of the event in the detector. The event might be a, you know, a point-like event for our purposes, very low energy, very tiny track. And then the hit pattern, the pattern of light in this top PNT array, gives us the XY position of the event as well. So we get a tremendous amount of information for all of these very low energy events. In addition, if you get a particle that scatters twice or three times or more in the detector, then you're going to get multiple charge clouds produced. Those charge clouds will reach the surface and give you pulses, and you'll see multiple S2 pulses. And you'll know that's background. Okay, a dark matter particle wouldn't scatter twice. We're lucky if it scatters once. Dr. McKinsey, back before you were talking about the different Nobel gases, and you said, and you had this electron diffusion um, parameter that you said was different for these different ones. And at that point, I had to put together why that matters, but it's, it's, it's about this, this detection method. You need to have it come out and, and go into the, into the gaseous argon so it fluoresces and, and you can right. see it. And there's a qualitative change. If you look at the lightest gases, the drift times are actually very, very slow. I think it wasn't a number, but it was a... They're low. Maybe, yeah, yeah, there it is. It's, com it's a more complicated story for liquid helium and liquid helium. But, but yeah, so we take advantage of this relatively high electron mobility uh, to pull those through the liquid xenon on a reasonable time scale so that we can take an S2 and correlate it with an S1. So we can say that S1 and S2 are from the same event. Therefore, I can figure out the depth of the event. Also, it turns out that the ratio of charge to light, S2 over S1 ratio, is different for a nuclear recoil, the signals we're looking for, compared to an electron recoil, which is most of our background. So we have this gamma ray rejection, also rejects betas, krypton beta decay in our detector. We have a smidgen of krypton in our detector that can create a background, but this charge to light ratio can help us reduce that. Okay, 
So if you look at some of these uh, gamma ray lines that are all around us, they go up to roughly you know 2.6 MeV. There's this prominent gamma ray from thorium, uh, and they go all the way down. Lots of peaks that you expect just everywhere you are. But for dark matter, we're looking at very low energies, down in the tens of keV. So there's a tiny smidgen of this that actually is the energy range we're looking for dark matter. And the fact is that there's this nice kinematic effect to help reduce the background in our detector. So the gamma rays that tend to penetrate are higher energy gamma rays, the MeVs. Okay, so the MeV gamma ray goes into our liquid xenon, it might scatter, Compton scatter, and give us some KeV of energy deposition. But it's hardly lost any of its energy, and it hardly diverts its path at all. It's going to just going to keep on going straight. And if it gets out the other side of the detector, that, could, that little KeV energy deposition could be a background for us. But the chance that it gets through, all the way through the detector, only scattering once, is very, very, very small. Basically, that's suppressed as e to the minus the size of the detector over some scattering length. And the scattering length is a few centimeters. So the chance that it gets through a 50 centimeter diameter detector without scattering is very small. And this is called self-shielding. The liquid xenon on the outside shields the liquid xenon on the inside from the gamma ray background. And this self-shielding is what makes Lux work. It allows us to get very low backgrounds. Okay. This is just a schematic of the Lux detector. It's sitting in a big water tank, an eight meter diameter water tank, a mile underground in South Dakota. You know, there's a it's, you know, phone booth sized cryostat in the middle made of ultra pure titanium um, and extremely low in radioactivity. Mounted in the stand, and here's a blow up of the detector, the bottom PMT array, a top PMT array, there are rings that, that basically create the electric field that we use for the detect make the detector work. And there's a 250 kilograms of active liquid xenon between the bottom grid and the top grid in the detector. That's our active volume in which we can look for dark matter. Here's some photos. There's a photo of it in the water tank. Here's a photo of one of our photomultiplier tubes. We use these to detect one photon, two photon, three photon, four photon. Very high gain, very sensitive light detectors. Here's the copper uh, uh, PMT holder that holds, in this case, 61 PMTs. And there's another one on the other side with another 61 PMTs. And then the inside of the detector is covered with Teflon, PTFE, for a very high reflectivity. Turns out the PTFE is very reflective for the liquid xenon scintillation light, which allows us to get even more sensitivity. And here's some photos of it coming together. That students built this thing. This thing was built by students. Okay. So in terms of the radioactivity, here's some of the backgrounds in our PMTs, some backgrounds in the titanium. The titanium was one of the larger mass objects near the, near the liquid xenon, but very low in background. And here's some more of the systems. Uh, my group did a lot on xenon handling, xenon purification. There's a system with lots of pumps and getters for that. We also worked on delivering the high voltage to the cathode. We built a, a specialty feed through. Um, and students helped build this and test this feed through. Students did a lot on helping uh, build and test the new gas system. Cryogenic system, we use liquid nitrogen to cool the, to cool the detector. And we have systems to recover the xenon in case things have to warm up. OK, and here's South Dakota. So we're in the Sanford Underground Research Facility, or CERC. And it's located out here in the Black Hills of South Dakota, near the town of Lead, South Dakota. And it's the old, the old Homestake Mine okay, that made the Hearst fortune. And, uh, this mine has the largest total integrated gold production of any mine in North America. This was the site of a big gold rush in the late 19th century. Near the town of Deadwood, if you've seen the HBO series, you know, some of them, where this area became famous and wealthy. And the lab is 4850 feet underground, which puts it at about sea level. So um, you, know, you go up. 
into the mountains and you're high above sea level and then you go down in the mine shaft and then you're about sea level once you're at the land. Here's the head frame. This is all you know, old mining uh, infrastructure that we're using for the laboratory. And here's the high-tech laboratory mile underground. Okay, so we have lots of electrical power, chilled water, uh, ventilation. It's very, it's, it's like being in a high-tech lab, you know, at a top research laboratory. Um, but you're a mile underground. So it's like just being in an office, just no windows. And here's the, uh, here's the experiment inside its water tank. There are actually some of these photomultiplier tubes, light detectors, on the walls of the water tank as well. You'll be able to spot muons, particles that go through and can leave a flash of light in the water. Yes? Experiment, how, much, how many man hours of data on the other end do you have to uh, compact it to get the data to be. I mean, they're talking about terabytes of data coming from each experiment. It's not like that, but it's still quite a bit. Most of our data comes from the catalog. By design, it's a very low background experiment. There's not a lot of data when we're looking for the dark matter. Most of our data comes from the inject radioactivity that I'll describe, and that generates a fair amount of data. Uh, I don't have a number off the top of my head, but I think integrated we have something like 10 terabytes of data. Because it's a low background experiment. Is this heavy water for sure? No, it's just regular water. But it is uh, clean to get rid of get the Radioactive, radioactivity down in the water and keep the radon down. Okay, so our timeline, we were funded in 2008 by DOE and NSF. It's a couple million dollar experiment. It's not by high new physics standard, it's not very much. Not much uh, the above ground laboratory was completed at SURF in 2011. We did a bunch of above ground commissioning runs. And then an underground laboratory was completed in 2012. And so in 2012, in the summer, we moved Lux underground into the Davis Cavern. The Davis Cavern is famous because it's the site of the experiment that first measured neutrinos coming from the sun. They used an enormous tank of cleaning fluid and sifted through it to find argon-37 atoms that were the product of neutrinos interacting with chlorine. So now we have a new funny liquid a mile underground in the same cavern. Uh, so the cool down and gas phase testing was completed by early February 2013. It was a very busy and stressful time getting the experiment running. The condensation was completed in mid-February 2013. The commissioning was completed by April 2013. And our first results were presented in October 2013. So we were on a very fast schedule. And we're still taking data. We uh, began a, a longer search in 2014, and that will continue until later this year. Okay, some of the figures of merit. So we would circulate the xenon about 250 kilograms per day, pulling it out of the detector, cleaning it, and putting it back in. That turns out to be a key uh, approach to getting a good performance of the experiment, is to be continually purifying the xenon. Uh, light collection, about 14%, okay and uh, drift field of 181 volts per centimeter. Our electron extraction efficiency, the probability that the electron gets extracted from the gas, about 64%. And a mass in which we're looking for the dark matter of 118 kilograms. This is a plot of the electron lifetime. Basically, if you stick an electron in liquid xenon, how long does it sit there until it gets gobbled up by some impurity? Okay, we need that lifetime to be long compared to the time it takes from an electron to get from the bottom of the detector to the gas, okay, which is about 300 microseconds. So as long as these numbers are well above 300 microseconds, we're in good shape. You look at a typical event, here are all the PMT channels. Okay, this is time in microseconds. So you initially see a little flash of light from the initial scatter. And then the electrons drift, and then you get a big flash of light as those are electrons are pulled into the gas. So the point is it's a very clean system, very low light levels until there's an event. 
So one of the things that worked on in my research group was a trick for calibrating the detector, which was to dissolve radioactive krypton in the experiment. Not the krypton I was complaining about earlier that gives you radioactivity in the air, but a different isotope called krypton 83M, which actually comes from rubidium 83 decay, and which can give you a small monoenergetic event. And krypton 83M decays away with just a couple hour half life. So we can put the Krypton 83M into the detector, use it to calibrate, it mixes all around, and gives us great calibration data, and then it decays away to give us a nice low background experiment. Again. And so all we need to do is for circulating xenon all the time, if we just divert some of the flow past some charcoal that's emitting this radioactive Krypton, then that Krypton gets flushed into the detector and we can calibrate. And when we're done, we just stop flowing through there and then, uh, then we're good. So this is just a little uh, piece of plumbing that you could use to open, close, and flush radioactivity into the detector. That's it. We just need a smidgen. We don't need much radioactivity to calibrate our super sensitive experiment. And here's how we could you know, open a valve, put in the krypton, and it could decay away over a day or so, wait a week, put in a, another little smidgen of radioactive krypton, and it would decay away drop the background and so on. We could do this repeatedly to keep precise tabs on exactly how much signal we were getting out of the experiment, make sure it was stable and working correctly. And so with that, we could make these gorgeous maps of the response of the experiment as a function of depth and as a function of x and y. Make slices throughout the experiment and see how much charge and light we were getting. Another trick we used was a similar one. We used tritiated method. So tritium is a hydrogen atom that had a couple extra neutrons in it. And it decays away, a beta decay, okay, a low energy beta decay, which is just perfect for us to calibrate our backgrounds, understand what backgrounds are like. And uh, our worry was that because tritium has a long half-life, if we put in tritium in the experiment and we couldn't get it back out, game over. Experiment's dead, too much background. But we convinced ourselves that we could put in tritium and get it back out quickly enough. In this case, we use tritiated methane, so CH4, but we replace one of the H's with the, hydro with the tritium. And we could then remove that by circulating the xenon through the getter. And so that's what we did. In fact, here we are, put in some tritium, and then it decays away as the, as the getter removes it. Wait some time, put it in, and it decays away. And here's a map of events in the detector. Every one of those dots is a tritium event. And they would just mix around thoroughly in the experiment and allow us to calibrate the response of the experiment to background. And so we could look at the tritium response in both light on this axis and in charge on this axis and really map out the experiment's response. And here's just the tritium beta decay spectrum that we got from a study of, of the response of the experiment. Works just nice, very well. And here, if we look at the charge to light ratio, S2 over S1, we could look at that band that we get from tritium, electron recoils, and compare that to the band that we get for nuclear recoils, okay, which we could make using fast neutron sources. That neutrons will scatter from nuclei and look like the signal you get from dark matter. Okay. And then, based on past measurements of light and charge yields in liquid xenon, we could model the signal we would expect to get from dark matter. And to be conservative, we assume that that model is shut off for really low energies, sort of an unphysical assumption. But since we didn't have calibration data below that energy, we just assume that it went to zero. And I'll come to that, back to that in a moment. So this is the light yield for nuclear recoils compared to a particular gamma ray that we use for calibration versus nuclear recoil energy. Okay, so what happened with that data over the summer of 2013? Well, here's the middle of the detector and it's pretty quiet. We ended up with about the same background rate that we expected from our previous understanding of radioactivity in the experiment. And here's some of the radioactivity mapping out in liquid xenon the various peaks that we uh, expected compared to what we measured, it's quite good. And uh, if you compare the rates that we saw compared to what we measured, they're just about the same. Okay. So we, things made sense. 
Now, if we look at all the events that summer, we had about 84 million events in the summer. Uh, the tiny cut on, you know, if the pressure went out a little bit or uh, grid voltages changed a bit, then we cut out those time periods. Uh, then we picked out detect single scatter events. Remember, most background will cause multiple scatters, whereas dark matter will only scatter once. So we picked out the single scatter events, and that dropped us to six and a half million. <coughs> then if you only looked at a certain range in S1, in the light yield, that gave us 26,000 events. Another cut on S2, down to 21,000 events. A very small cut to times when there were a lot of electrons popping out of the experiment. Uh, small cut to get us down to this number. And then a drift time cut away from the grids. Okay, or the background quite a bit. And then a radial cut to get away from the edges, and that got us down to 160 events. Yes? So you're marching down, like you get all of these events, and you're some level this is you're excluding these things. Mm -hmm. The last ones are, are this is about the self shielding, about wanting That's to right. get that volume that that should be pristine. You're gonna have the the events you don't want to count and you want to throw them away, and they're gonna happen at the edges and you see it, you have the statistics of it happening where you, you can you can look at that. And so you're gonna end up with at this point kind of an exciting number, a countable number yeah. of hundred and sixty events which yeah. are interesting to you. That's right. Okay, we also studied our efficiencies in great detail using our calibration sources, uh, using the neutron sources, using the tritium sources to make sure we understood exactly our efficiencies for detecting these dark matter events. Okay, and here are the events that were remaining. Remember the blue band is our electron recoil band. The red band is our nuclear recoil band where the dark matter signal would lie. And there's some fraction of these that'll spill over into smaller charge to light ratios. And we found that that was consistent with our background modeling and all this tritium data that we took. And so we were basically able to put a limit on the amount of dark matter interactions that were happening in our experiment. And our, basically our, our data here consistent with no dark matter events. It's also consistent with a few dark matter events. It could be two to five dark matter events in there. Okay. Um, but that's not the hypothesis that we naturally choose here. Okay, here's this picture of those events also in the fiducial mass. The dot is one of those events on the previous slide. And so we came out of this and we were able to plot a limit excluding cross sections above this blue curve. And we had a limit that was the best in the world. The best, we basically saw nothing better than anyone else. <laughs> 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 And zooming into the lower mass region here, okay, we were able to exclude some of these other experiments, you know, potential interpretations of those experiments as being to a few dark matter events, to a high degree okay, of confidence. So, anyway, we were the bad news. We came along and said, no, you weren't seeing dark matter. You haven't seen the one. In fact, we had 20 times more sensitivity at this interesting mass than our competitors. And coming out of that, we were able to draw this new line here, okay, from this 20, our 2013 release. Okay, so since then, we've been doing a lot of cal new kinds of calibrations. Here's a clever one that I'll tell you about uh, using um, monoenergetic neutrons. I'll say it's clever because it's not my idea. It's one of my collaborators at Brown University. And uh, what they did was they made this neutron beam that came in through the side of the experiment. You could scatter neutrons, and by knowing the kinematics, the scattering kinematics of neutrons or xenon atoms, you could work out how much energy is right there in that point. Okay. And then from the, looking at multiple scatters and using this delta T, you could work out the scattering angle to calculate the energy. And then uh, and there, thereby, you can know exactly how much charge is being produced for a certain energy recoil. So here we have this tube that we put gas in. We put the tube in the water tank, and we were able to raise it up right next to the cryostat and have a neutron generator outside the water tank beaming neutrons into the experiment. Okay. 
Okay, so here's the image of the beam measured using our data in the xenon detector. Here's a, uh, in, a photo of the neutron generator outside the water tank. Okay. Here's a, the images of the beam in simulation and in actual data. Uh, it's viewed from the top in, in the xenon data. Okay. And in, using this data, we were able to calibrate the response of our detector in situ in our actual experiment, how much light and charge do you get from, uh, from neutron scattering? And so we were able to map out the charge per unit energy, and by, and by using the uh, neutron recoil band, the ratio of charge to light, we were then able to get the light yield as a function of energy as well, here. And then able to then quantify our dark matter signal efficiency very accurately. So if I read the bottom one, you're saying at ranges of energy between a few kilo electron volts and 50 or whatever it is you expect to detect every event that comes in you were you were making your own tests one is saying you detect all of them and so this the and you probably expected that for high enough energy things mm -hmm. and on the low energy you expect to find it harder to have right. to detect these more, events more and more often you're just not getting enough photons to trigger to get through the ones. And so this quantifies our efficiency of seeing these very low energy nuclear recoils. Okay, but because we had now data down to one keV, okay, before we only had data down to what, four keV. Okay, so that allowed us to sorry three keV, and that allows us to go even much lower in energy and basically claim look down at light fields that we weren't counting as possibly being from dark matter. And that allowed us to set a more stringent limit. Okay, and that paper just appeared on the archive a couple months ago. That's, that's a new result from us. And so right now we still have the most sensitive limit, uh, all up to arbitrarily high mass, all the way down to four GeV, four times the mass of a proton. And there's another project, also some folks at Berkeley who work on it using germanium and silicon, who have somewhat better limits down for really, really low. Mass dark matter particles. Okay, so I'm almost out of time, I think. I'll just flash up a couple of slides about a new experiment called Lux Zeppelin. Uh, it's a merger of two collaborations, Lux and Zeppelin. Okay, Zeppelin was a UK based liquid xenon project. Uh, we've got twice as many institutions, about twice as many people. It's a scale up of 50 in fiducial mass. This mm -hmm. is what Lux is, this is what LZ will be. And here's a schematic of it. And there's going to be 10 tons of liquid xenon in there, okay, seven tons in the active volume. That's about $10 million of xenon. Um, but you don't destroy the xenon. No, no, no. So. But you still, it will give you credit for that, but you still have to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there are no loan. You can't take xenon loans from the <laughs> uh, so it's about $10 million of xenon. Actually, my students pointed out to me there's actually a card game you can buy <laughs> called Xenon Profiteer. I would have bought it. Yeah, it's fun. But yeah, so you use your entrepreneurial spirit in an air separation facility to isolate valuable xenon and make a profit. <laughs> so, so they're making profit off us, I think. Um, and then later, we'll make profit off them when we sell the fact. <laughs> Anyway, so we're, we expect to get about a you know a hundred times more sensitivity um, in in LZ than we expect to end up with in Lux. Uh, we'll run it for several years. It requires, of course, many systems to all work together correctly, and so and we have to work together a mile underground. We need systems that are stable, and work, and don't break. Because if anything, any of these is not working, your experiment is, is not working. And so there's actual, a, a, if you're interested, there's a conceptual design report you can find on the archive describing our design uh, for LZ. We've started buying xenon. We've started buying the cryostat, another enormous titanium cryostat, and the photomultiplier tube, some of the long lead items. And actually, tomorrow, in the next few days, we have a big review happening at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Um, external reviewers to tell the Department of Energy that we have our act together, or not. But I think it will go well. There's going to be 500 of PMTs, 
My group are working a lot on how to deliver the high voltage from the side. There's this big umbilical that connects to the cathode. We don't want anything to break down and make light or cause it, break the experiment. So that's, there's a lot of testing of high voltage that's ongoing at, uh, at LBL and elsewhere. And there's lots more calibration sources. We're going to use neutron-activated xenon. We're going to use so-called boron, radon-220, some more kinds of fancy neutron sources that we're working on. We have all sorts of very low activity, but kind of odd radioactive sources that we use to calibrate the experiment. And uh, so here's an image of the cryostat that's going to be uh, built, and some images of the titanium that's been assayed to show that it's very low in radioactivity. A fiducial mass we expect to be 5.6 tons, and we have a couple of vetoes out the act, outside the active volume to help do that. And we expect a background on the end of about two events, and actually that's dominated by neutrinos. The main background is coming from neutrinos, from the sun, and from the atmosphere. And uh, we're, getting, we're going to be getting closer to the neutrino floor. Uh, here's some uh, simulated uh, LZ exposure, the bands that you saw before. This is what a dark matter, set of dark matter events would look like. And actually, we're going to start to see, we think, neutrinos from the sun scattering in our liquid xenon, uh, giving us events like these pink dots. In fact, a process where neutrino scatters from an entire nucleus, a process that's actually never been seen before, we should be able to see in LZ. And here's our projected sensitivity. And getting pretty close to the neutrino floor. And so here's where the boron-8 neutrinos show up. So we start cutting through this corner, we start expecting to see neutrino events from so-called boron-8 neutrinos. In the sun. And of course, there are many theoretical models, uh, particular models where the dark matter might interact with ordinary matter by exchanging a Higgs particle. A lot of those models are ones we're going to be able to test with LZ. So if we come out of LZ and we don't see events, we'll probably be able to say dark matter probably doesn't interact by exchanging the Higgs particle or something else. If we do see it, then it's going to open up you know, an entire subfield of physics, of WIMP astronomy. OK, also we're going to be able to do lots of neutrino physics with LZ, something called neutrinoless double beta decay, to see if the neutrino is its own antiparticle. We're going to be able to get for free basically, the same experiment. Uh, measuring solar neutrinos, look at, if a supernova happens, we're going to get lots of information about supernova neutrinos. Uh, sterile neutrinos, uh, we can also study. And if the neutrino has a magnetic moment, we might be able to see that as well. That's another mm -hmm. question. OK, so I don't have time. I'll skip through a few slides on double beta decay, give you our timeline. We expect to be running by 2019. Okay, just a few years away, and it's going to be, again, the most sensitive dark matter experiment in the world at that point. Our competitors right now, the Xenon Collaboration, are commissioning a new experiment right now. It's bigger than Lux, but not as big as LZ, so it's sort of leapfrogging in sensitivity. And so I hope I've convinced you that liquid Xenon is the preeminent target for WIMPs, mass above 4 GeV. Our new limit is about 6 times 10 to the minus 46 square centimeters for a wimp nucleon interaction. Um, we have lots of improvements in calibration techniques, understanding the background. And LZ is well underway, You're going to run in 2019 and give us uh, something like 30 times the current limit, or maybe 100 times what we eventually expect to get with Lux. And I'd like to leave you with a little version that my wife and I made up. <laughs> Who has seen the wimp? Neither I nor you. But when the liquid xenon flashes in the time projection chamber, <laughs> dark matter is passing through. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Neutrino experiment. Yeah, I was okay. using a huge tank, 300 tons of cleaning fluid. Not to look for dark matter. What is the difference between using like heavy water or regular water? Or oh, that's different. So, heavy water versus light water. So, heavy water and D2O, meaning that the hydrogens are replaced with deuterium, which has a proton and a neutron in the nucleus. And so, heavy water, uh, you can get heavy water. Um, and the main difference. It's used a lot in nuclear reactors in Canada. And we use deuterium because it doesn't absorb neutrons nearly as much. So there are certain kinds of nuclear reactors that we use D2O. Um, uh, D2O, there's, there's a famous experiment called Snow that uh, happened in Sudbury, Canada, that used an enormous tank of heavy water to look for several different kinds of neutrino interactions that were able to prove that neutrinos from the sun change flavor or type. It's, Whole other talk, but uh, but well, with dark matter, it's the same thing. Dark matter, in fact, we like hydrogen because it sucks up the neutrons before it can get to us. Right. Right. Your detector allows you to determine the position inside the detector where the interaction took place, mm -hmm. but there's no way to know like what direction the thing, you know, the object came from, or is there a, a theoretical source of these? So, so dark matter, so we are, our, our, our solar system is going around the galaxy at around 200 kilometers per second. But at the same time, the dark matter is whizzing around in all kinds of directions around the galaxy. So there's a preferred direction, but not a strongly preferred direction. And we can't see the direction of the nuclear recoil. We, in this detector, we don't have that capability. There are a number of groups around the world that are working on R&D basically gaseous time projection chambers where you can get a long enough track that you can help to image it. And so those are so-called directional dark matter uh, detectors. Ours is not directional. Now some of the other particles like gamma rays. Gamma rays you can get directionality in an experiment like this by knowing if you have multiple scatters and knowing those energies of those scatters you can actually figure out where that gamma ray came from. Um, and so we haven't done it yet, but we could study the backgrounds in our experiment using that Compton imaging. Can I follow up on that? Because the, you had the first reaction. It was, you had a nice diagram when you were talking about the injected signal with the neutrons you were sending. But you have the original signal, and I'm assuming the photomultipliers on both ends, do they get spatial information? You know, the depth is going to come from the duration until it comes out again, but there is, you, you showed, at least with the neutron, you showed an interaction, and then was it the, was it the, the particles had a particular direction, the, the electrons that get produced? Well, we used the off and then dis we used diffuse the from, a, from a different area? I, I was wondering when you said you didn't actually, can't tell the direction of the, yeah, that's the figure. Yeah, you yeah said so, that you so we don't, yeah, we don't actually, uh, from the data, in here, we don't figure out the direction. But here we are using the fact that we have prior knowledge of the direction. 
have a beam of neutrons coming in. And we use that fact, we use that information to be able to reconstruct the energy deposited at this, this point. I see. You, you have no data that's ever going to tell you that because that's not where your shower, your initial, your initial shower of photons don't come from that, they come from the... Yeah, I mean, not on an event-by-event -event basis. Of course, I showed you some images where if you take lots of data to figure out where the events are, <laughs> using the, you know, our usual methods, then you can see, oh yeah, there's the beam. Yeah. But we don't know that direction on an event-by-event -event basis. And did you say those were polarized as well? No, the neutrons are not polarized. They're just in a beam. But they're all monochromatic? From a, a they're monochromatic. They have all the same energy. A plutonium beryllium source? Uh, in this case, it's a deuterium deuterium generator. Oh. So you, it's tabletop fusion. It's like this big, mm -hmm. It smacks deuterium atoms into other deuterium atoms, and that turns them into a helium-3 and a neutron. And the neutron has 2.5 MeV energy. And then that's outside the water tank, and the water shields the stuff that's not in the beam, and so we end up with a beam of neutrons coming down that tube. And, and then you can do this nice trick of measuring the scattering. So they, uh, they really understand our uh, signals for low energy nuclear nuclear nuclear. Yes. Could you comment on, you know, uh, WIMPs as a uh, dark matter candidate versus the, let's take the A prime uh, for the dark photons, for example. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I didn't talk about dark photons, but dark photons are another well-motivated candidate for the dark matter. Um, so there are some theories that, in a way, are sort of less connected to our existing theory, but are quite plausible, where there's a whole set of interactions of dark matter particles can have among themselves. And the idea could be that ordinary matter you know, interacts through photon exchange, and W and Z and Higgs exchange, and gluons. But suppose dark matter doesn't do any of those things. It just lives in its own little universe interacting with itself or with particles like it. Okay. It's possible then that you could have in this set of other um, theories something called the dark photon. Like our photon, but low mass as well. And then it's through virtual interactions through a higher energy scale, by exchanging some very heavy particle like might have been in the Big Bang, you can still get virtual interactions that can turn a dark photon into an ordinary photon. And so what you would see are things that like millicharged, microcharged particles interacting through a dark photon into an ordinary photon. It would be like particles that have a very small effective mass. It's also possible, effective charge. It's also possible that dark photons themselves are the dark matter. Um, in which case you might look for uh, things creating electron recoils in the detector. They won't make nuclear recoils, they like to interact with photons, but they might be able to cause occasional ionization your experiment that you wouldn't otherwise see. And so another set of searches we can do with Lux is to look for these rare ionization events and thereby look for that papers. And so uh, keep an eye out for uh, the archive. We may have such papers. Uh, another one you identify was axions. Well, axions are different. But it's another kind of dark matter. Okay. It's another dark matter idea called the axion. It's kind of motivated in a different way. There's another very strong motivation for axions. Um, they help solve the so-called CP problem, a strong interaction. There's a certain term in the strong interaction, which is extremely small, ten minus three. And a term like that gets so small, and you think, well, that's kind of weird. Why would it be so small? Maybe it's zero. And then the, there's a certain mechanism called the Petschek Klein mechanism that allows you to get to be zero, kind of averages out if there's a particle. It's an excitation of that parameter. And then on average, that particle averages out, averages out, averages that out to zero. So that'd be the particle axion. And axions can also be the dark matter. And so there are a number of experiments to look for axions. Uh, one example is that axions can interact with a magnetic field and create photons. And so there is an experiment up at University of Washington, 
going to have an enormous resonant cavity with a very high magnetic field. And they tune the resonant frequency of the cavity. It's like a tunable radio. We can look for half possible axion. If you tune in just to the right frequency, which corresponds to the max of the axion, you should get a lot of power. So there should be this one particular frequency of the axion that um, generates a lot of power when you tune into it. I should say a lot of power. It's something <laughs> tiny enough to power. But, but compared to the background, if you tune into it, you should be able to see this much too. So axions are very low in mass, like micro EV, uh, but they're created as a Bose condensate, and that's why they're cold. Uh, and so in light, lightweight like neutrinos, and um, being relativistic, you can smear out a small scale structure. Axions, because they're produced in this extremely cold state, can do it that way. So that's a whole other uh, talk. Uh, that's actually folks at Berkeley who work on that. I'm going to ask I'm you about the axions. <laughs> That's another very exciting area. So is the LZ uh, sensitive to uh, CDN, cold dark matter? Well, WIMPs are a kind of CDN. CDN is the broad, it's the, CDN just means cold dark matter. So WIMPs or axions or dark photons. As long as they're dark matter and they're cold, they're cold dark matter. One final question, I think, Carmen, you yeah, for, just for clarification, could you go back to the, the photo of the inside of the detector? Okay. Uh, I was wondering if that's going to fill up with water, was the whole inside of it? Yeah, the whole, all that space is full of water. That's right. So this was just before they filled it. That, yeah. So the yep. whole thing gets filled up with water. Yeah, the whole thing is filled with water. There's actually a port where you uh, can go in and you can close up. But yeah, this photo was taken right before it was filmed. But the whole thing is filled with water. It's that ultra pure water. Inside is the actual Lux. Yeah, Lux is inside this thing. Okay. That's our titanium crust. A mile underground. I must imagine you feel like a Bond villain on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, sometimes I actually use that as a joke. Go into the underground lab, it's very high tech, but it feels like me. Great James Bond. Indeed. <laughs> All right, let's thank our speaker.